Okay, so this is Marty Wilson speaking. It's February 29th, uh, 2024, Leap Day, right? <laughs> and I'm sitting here with Debbie Kulik uh, at the Monroe County Historical Association, and we're here to talk about her life and about EMS in Smithfield County? In Monroe County. Oh, in Monroe County. Okay, great. And Lower Pike. All right, well, let's start with Debbie Kulik and where where you were born and when you were born, and then we'll talk about your parents a little bit. Okay. I was born in East Stroudsburg in Monroe County General Hospital, and uh, I'm a local, so therefore one of the few people. Growing up, my dad was a principal, and he would always say to us at that time, remember... Uh, you are probably one of the people who has lived here, but there are very few people who moved here. So they probably don't understand the local vernacular and that type of thing. But today, I'm a rarity. Because you're a local. Man. I'm a local. Not local. That he always used to say, you're not really local around here. People don't believe you're local until you're at least second or third generation. <laughs> Well, and your dad was what's his name? What's his name? Joseph Kulik. He was uh, he was a teacher, and uh, originally graduated from the first public school class for the normal school, which is now East Stroudsburg University. We have six generations who've gone through East Stroudsburg, How about that? and uh, his first job uh, as a teacher was in the one room schoolhouse, which was the Arlington Schoolhouse. And where was that? Right, uh, right the where the Arlington School the is school today. Is now, yeah. And he bought that for $300. And it was during World War II, so he moved it out and built a foundation around it. And my house today is the base of it, is the schoolhouse. And then the house was built around it. I love that. And your mom? My mom came from... Uh, Hoboken, New Jersey, and uh, she was up here as a, uh, a student nurse, and her aunt and uncle owned Echo Lake Farms, and the family, my grandparents, would come with her to help close up the, the hotel for the summer because we closed hotels at Labor Day then. And uh, she started her first day of school in Middle Smithfield School where my father at the time was the senior teacher of the four-room schoolhouse. And mm -hmm. he told the story at his retirement that uh, his, her father said to him when he brought her to school for first grade, her first day of first grade, that Mr. Kulik, please take care of my daughter. And he said at the time, and I'm still taking care of her. So. They married, obviously, many years later when she was a student nurse, she met him again at the hotel where he was a social director because they didn't work all year. So in the summer, he was a social director. And during the year, he was the principal head teacher. So it's no mystery then when you, where you went to elementary school, I assume, Arlington, right? No, I went to elementary school, Middle Smithfield School. Okay, so I, I guess... It's Chronology. Your dad bought, buys the house. Did he live in that house, the old school up in Arlington? Well, no, he moved it to Middle Smithfield Township. Oh, I missed it got that moved part. all the way to Middle Smithfield oh, Township. God. And uh, his second school he was at was the two room two room schoolhouse in Analomic. And he said the biggest adventure there, or the the advantage, was in the Arlington school. He had to get there at four thirty in the morning during the winter because he had to start the wood fire to heat the school. But the Analomic school was cold, so he could get there at 6.30 in the morning because he just had already banked the coal from the night before. So from that school, they hired him to teach in the four-room schoolhouse of Middle Smithfield. Hmm. Now, Echo Lake, is that the one that was on the left as you went up to nine? It's, the lake is still there. But I mean the resort, the resort. The resort, right. It was right before where the Indian Museum is today, where Lake of the Pines is today. Okay. It was on both sides of the road, and the hotel itself had uh, 200 feet into the lake 
was their side and Vacation Valley, now known as Pocono Palace, which it's going to be something else, I guess, but um, had the balance of the lake, the shin zone that. And been. were you involved as a kid at working at the resort, helping out? Uh, I was, since I was a child child then, I was generally for Queen of the Week, which he ran, um, I was usually the person walking with the little flower basket, dropping the fake flowers on either side of the carpet. That so was Queen of the Week was something they did for the guests? Yeah, it was an activity. Yeah. They did a, a whole, he had a lot of different activities. He worked there until that closed and then he moved to other places and eventually ended up his final place that he was the social director was uh, Mountain Lake House, although he helped at Unity House before it closed as well. Hmm. So, uh, how old were you when your family sold the resort? We didn't, we didn't own the resort. My great aunt and uncle did, and they left it to their nephew. Oh, I see. All right, so anyway, you go to school in Smithfield Township. Middle Smithfield. Middle Smithfield. I always get the, get, right township, <laughs> get the right township. The right township there. I know. Yeah. Uh, and then you graduated from East Stroudsburg High School. High School. Mm -hmm. And went right to ES, well, East Stroudsburg State Teachers College, I guess at the time. Right, it was the State Teachers College. And you studied what? Elementary education, oddly enough. So you became a teacher then? I did. My first degree is in teaching, my second, my master's is in uh, organizational management with nonprofit and government as an emphasis. Where did you teach? Um, I substituted for the district and then I purchased a, uh, an employment agency and I owned an employment agency for a while and then Charlie Kirkwood, I always say, hired me off the porch of the playhouse and said, I want to see you come talk to me. They had no personnel department, so I ran and started the personnel department for the Shawnee group when it was the big group. I'm no kidding. So how long were you there? Twelve years. Ah. Yeah. And then when when they they changed the group and they sold off portions of the group and did different things, um, then I went into business for myself and I have since 1992 at an employee leasing agency, and I lease uh, primarily EMS employees. Which we're going to oddly talk about enough, here, yes. And, but before we get to that, what was it like growing up in Middle Smithfield Township? It was the go outside and play, and when you count ten cars, you can come back in. When you, we were small. And because it was very rural. And it took the day. <laughs> you know, you came back, you went out in the morning, you came back in the afternoon. Well, you didn't go far because we lived out in the country, right? So, and then as the, uh, as the area developed and we had the heavy truck traffic where we would have tens of thousands of tractor trailers along 209 every day, um, then it became much more commercial. So, you know, that was during my teenage years. And now that we've, uh, they've banned the trucks on 209, there were literally truck accidents with people who died every single week because the tractor trailers just ran up and down that road. Well, I remember there were, used to be protests in Milford when the trucks would come up 209, go through mm -hmm. Milford. Yes, and the Park Service, of course, has had the ban on, and it's a federal ban on trucks there, so that has almost completely eliminated, except for local deliveries, basically, the truck traffic on 209. But it was exceptionally dangerous, exceptionally dangerous. So when you lived up there, I'm trying to get a sense And I of, live in the house I grew up in, so. So you're still in that house? I'm still Is in that the house. Is that within sight of 209? Mm-hmm, yeah. It's, uh, Right there on Keelick Drive, where my sister lives, and my mother lives, and my brother lives, and my son lives. Uh -huh. Yes. Well, what I was wondering about is going to Stroudsburg, was that like going to the city? What was it, it was. It was going to town. Yeah. It was, you know, once a week, maybe to go grocery shopping. My mom would load us all in the car and take us to the, so the, 
to the store and do the grocery shopping. And, it's kind of exciting to go. Yeah, well, yeah, that was a that was a big outing. Yeah, that was a big outing. And for did you us. go to Wyckoff's Tea Room and all that? Wyckoff's, right, and Counterman's Drug Store. Okay. And uh, along Crystal Street, Coster's, along Crystal Street yeah. there, and watch the train come through periodically. That was exciting. Did you ever ride the train into the city or up to? No. No. no, we went. If we went to the city, we went by car because my mother's parents lived in uh, Union City, so we would go by car. Yeah. Although when we took bus trips in school, in elementary school, because my dad was our principal in elementary, and we would take a bus trip into New York, he would always make sure that the bus went through the Bowery, because at that time. It was the Bowery, and he'd stand up and say, this is what happens when you make bad decisions and you don't devote the time you need to develop your life and to do productive things, because it was truly the old Bowery. And uh, kids would be, for a lot of us, it was the first time we ever went to the city, so. You know, but he he would say that every time, and he'd have the bus driver drive through there so that the kids could see what uh, what doing something with your life made a difference to where you could end up. Huh. So anyway, getting back to your the EMS connection, you mm -hmm. had an a, a, a employment agency, and you what's the connection between the employment agency and the EMS? It's just after I left Shawnee, it made a natural uh, progression for me because it was the time where EMS agencies were no longer able to find as many volunteers. I started volunteering 50 years ago, so when I came in, there were volunteers, and that's all we had to run EMS. And virtually all the places in the county were run by volunteers, and there weren't a lot of other things for kids to do, for people to do. So volunteering became a very large portion of people's lives. So at one point, every agency could staff 24 hours a day covering coverage by simply having volunteers on board. I remember and, when I was a kid, my dad volunteered for the ambulance in Mountain Home. Is that what we're talking Barrett, about? Barrett, Barrett, Barrett. Mm -hmm. Barrett Ambulance, which is no longer in. But, but am I correct in assuming that, that those ambulance organizations sort of morphed into the EMS? Well, they were the EMS. EMS is your ambulance service, your emergency medical services. Okay. So if he if he volunteered for Barrett Ambulance, then he was one of those people who I said. We had lots of volunteers back then, and the call volume was nowhere near where it is today, nor was the required training, nor was the required uh, bit of equipment that we have to have today. So did you become an EMT, or did you end get involved in that way, or was it just trying to staff? No, I in high school. I, uh, I took all the first aid courses because that's all you really had to have back then was a first aid course. And then when the EMT program started in the late 70s, I took the EMT program. And uh, that's when they first started asking people to go beyond first aid and advanced first aid and to, to complete these programs. So uh, I was in one of those first EMT classes in the county. Where was it? I'm just curious. At the uh, at MCTI, or known as the Monroe County Boat Tech School. Yeah, yeah that's right. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Rob Gardner was the. I don't uh, remember the names. Yeah. Boy, Rob Gardner and his wife were our instructors. Could be. Yeah. Yep, and like the second course in the state, I think it was. I don't remember. So long ago for me, anyway. It was. It was a whopping forty-five dollars. I don't remember that part. There you go. See? You had to pay 45 just $45 to take that course. Huh. And I thought it was highway robbery, but given today, I, I think I've had a very good investment. So, 
you said that uh, back then it was easy to staff, you know, volunteers 24 hours a day, and today not so much. Why? Well, today What's the changed? well the the amount of training that has to be uh, completed, the cost of the training is something else. The uh, the constant review, the constant upgrade in equipment, so you have to learn the new equipment, and uh, just just the sheer volume of what has to happen. Now, I'm going to guess that your father probably responded from home when there was an ambulance call. Yep. Okay, my first ambulance call, and I, I was, like I said, I was in high school, and they assigned me to a crew with, with two other people on it, and uh, they called on the phone at two in the morning. My mother answered the phone, came to the door and said, there's an ambulance call, do you think you wanna go? And I remember saying to her, no, when there's a call, you have to go. And uh, I responded, and 25 minutes later, the ambulance started out for the call. Today, you call, and your ambulance is out of the barn or out of the bay within uh, two minutes, three minutes tops. So where we could go from home, now we have to be at the buildings. So that started some of that change where people couldn't respond from home. The cost of the, that $45 program is now uh, relatively around a thousand and my three and a half to four months that I took to train is over six months plus time on the truck after that. And of course, now you have people who have the expectation of not just go in the ambulance. And I do remember this is my grandfather fell in our basement and broke his ankle and the ambulance came and that was from the hospital and it was staffed by the uh, cleaning guys the custodians, they would take the ambulance and go get a patient. And they got them up, put them in the back, just sat with them when they drove them to the hospital. And uh, that, that was your ambulance service before we, places like Bushkill Emergency Corps started out that direction. Uh, and that was simply for the, the county, it was basically like that. And I've spoken to some other folks who worked at the hospital during that time while they were in school. And they said, yeah, we just used to get in the back and drive out and put the person in the back and we just drive to the hospital and take them out. And what'd you do for them? Well, we didn't have any training. We just drove them there. That's what you did. And first ambulances were actually hearses. So uh, there was a maybe job security for the undertaker. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> along, along the way, uh, you know, now a paramedic is what people expect. Okay, is the paramedic coming? A paramedic is the, the hands of the doctor in the field. So you're actually getting the emergency room coming to you and the work of the emergency room is started in the field. And those courses can cost anywhere from eight to $25,000. So hence the reason we now have migrated to careers. They're now careers. I wanted to ask you about that, but before we do, I want you to confirm a memory of mine. I remember my dad putting on a white jumpsuit every time he had to go out. Did you have to do something like that? We had green jumpsuits. You had a jumpsuit. Well, I had a jumpsuit. First we had lab coats, and then we got high tech, and we got jumpsuits. Uh -huh. And then we went to shirts and pants. And you know, now today it's much the same. But yes, we had the jumpsuits. Well, I find this business about uh, professionalizing mm -hmm. you know, the EMS interesting. And I wanted to ask you about that. But before we get there, you're in high school and you're getting called out to car accidents and things? Mm-hmm. Car accidents. What was it like for you? Do you remember any specific hor horrific Incidents? That's always the question a high school student asks when you try to convince them that they want mm -hmm. to become an EMS provider. What's the worst thing you ever saw? So one of my early calls was a decapitation from a truck coming down 209. Another one of my early calls was a tractor trailer that went through a car and 
there was half the person left in the car. So. And you're a high school student mm -hmm. experiencing these things. You know what it does? And, and I tell this to parents all the time. If you can put your child into courses like the EMT course or the course where they end up doing volunteer work, whether it's fire, rescue, or EMS, it teaches people what making bad decisions and poor decisions, what happens lots of times because they see that. Um, my son is now a paramedic who works with us. And literally at 16, well, actually he became a, a patient, a practice patient in every class we taught all the way along. He, as he got older, he just became the next version of a patient you needed along the way. But um, it taught him, if you make a bad decision, if you make a poor choice in life, this is what happens. And you can't always save everyone if they make a poor choice. You do your very best, but you can't always save someone. I do say the difference today between when I started was my first person had congestive heart failure. We delivered her to the hospital dead. Today, she would have had all that medication, everything else. She would have gone back home and come back to enjoy her next vacation. Yeah. So we save people. We save people today. And it's a very under um, underappreciated service here and across the United States. So, and, and it's also a service where we don't have a lot of people coming into the service. And I think it's, it's the fault of both the educators not exposing people, kids to it, and the fact that it's an underappreciated service to the communities. And, but it's a phenomenal uh, jumping spot for people to go into other careers. For I can um, I have a, a kid right now who started as a as a uh, an EMT in high school. He's going to med school, but he still works here part time mm. on the weekends when he comes home. I have nurses. We've we've graduated nurses. My sister is a nurse and uh, she runs Actually, as of now, she runs all of Lehigh Valley's training programs except for Pocono Medical Center, where my brother, who was also, we were all volunteers, uh, runs the Pocono Medical Center training mm -hmm. center. Um, my other sister is a principal, but she does two or three nights, two or three nights during summer and during winter, one or two nights she'll beyond duty, but there it is, you know. So it helps in so many ways. PAs, we've had people become PAs. We've had people become um, techs in the hospitals. We've had people who've taken that particular training and used it to be able to put them into other places like nurse practitioners and it, now today it opens doors in uh, in the sports areas too because a, a trainer today has to become an EMT but that experience helps them so much to understand what's happening when something happens to a kid. Are there still volunteers then? There must be volunteers. I'm a volunteer. So I don't get can paid. you talk about how it became professionalized and to what extent it's professional. My sister's a volunteer. Her son's a volunteer. We, we do still, we have, Bushkill primarily ha is the only place where we have volunteers left and we work with the paid people. So it, it works out for us and it really has helped us significantly. But um, it, it became that paid way because it became a career 
it was no longer like your dad. Uh, he probably did something else in his yeah, day job, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So if somebody has a different day job, you know, I have someone who's a, uh, a school police officer, and it's fine for him to come and do some time. Uh, my nephew is a police officer. He volunteers his time. My sister is a principal. She volunteers her time. So, so at Bushkill, to give us an idea, how many professional paid people are there and how About many 25. Volunteers? 25 paid people. And right. somebody's always there, like right. two or three people are always yes, there. Yes, there's always two or three, sometimes four. You know, it could be two crews. If you have two crews on, you have maybe four people. Used to be years ago when I first started, but I say I was a third person. There were some places that had so many volunteers, they had maybe four people on a truck to run. Today, a typical crew is two people. Typical crew. So let's say it's midnight and a call comes in, there's an accident on 209, and there are three people in residence at this. Do they call up volunteers to? No, no, that, that crew goes out and the tongues, the, the control center, which has developed greatly from being above the old East Strasburg firehouse where Charlie Deacon sat there and did all the, uh, the dispatches. And now Gary Hoffman was dispatcher number two, um, who is now in charge of the Monroe County Control Center. But, you know, those guys would set off some tones. We had a little plectron and we carried it. Once we got beyond call us on the phone, you know, when it was call you on the phone, you didn't go anywhere. You stayed home because you knew if you were on, they had to call you on the phone. So you're on call. So you were on call. Then once we got these boxes that they called a plectron and they could set a tone off, at least you could go somewhere else and plug it in and you would get the call that way. Then they moved to the small pagers and uh, you know now today we have the combination of the pager and you get a notification on your cell phone that there's a call as well but uh, you know that's what would happen is they would be alerted they would go out if they think they hear there's more victims than they could handle they would ask for another ambulance service and a re-alert for anybody who might be able to pick up something to come. And some of the fire companies, you know, they do the rescue, lots of them. Uh, Marshall's Creek actually has an, an ambulance too that they'll supplement, you know, maybe a fire standby or if there's a need for an extra truck somewhere in the county and they have available people, their people may come out and do that. So, you know, it, it it's, it's a very intricate system, and it's not not one that people understand readily. Yet you know, our local governments have now uh, gotten to the point where they say, this is a service that has to be provided. So in many of the townships now, there is an EMS tax and a fire tax to help support the organizations. Right now, fire is all volunteers throughout the county. So the EMS side of it, uh, you know, fire come from home kind of thing yet. But at some point that will progress into needing to have people paid as well. But we're just over that border first. Does that EMS tax pay the bills? Uh, it helps. It doesn't pay all the bills. So where do you? Um, you, people always say, oh, you get the insurance payment. Well, what they don't understand, and this is a whole different um, program type of thing to learn about, is that insurance reimbursements are fairly well set. It could cost $1,200 to send the ambulance to you with the medications, with the equipment, with the people, with the truck use, et cetera. But Medicare and Medicaid have set limits, so they might pay you $350, $400. So you have that shortfall where you can't bill the person. 
So then it requires the tax money. It requires being frugal, uh, whatever grants you can get. Um, if you can run some fundraisers, that helps, that type of thing. It seems like we make it awfully difficult. <laughs> I just keep saying it's exciting. <laughs> it's very exciting. It's always an adventure. But, uh, you know, in my organization, we have no paid management. We're all volunteers. We're all volunteer management. Management's volunteer, but you have EMTs that are program. We have, I have some paid and volunteer EMTs. Okay. But, you know, in most places, there are paid supervisors, paid managers, paid staff to do things. I have folks who are kind enough, who are retirees, who have special skills and come in and help. So we're blessed in that respect. Do you happen to know offhand the annual budget ballpark figure for your organization? Um, where it should be <laughs> to be able to keep up with everything is about 1.2 million. What it actually has been has been about a 400 thousand dollars shortfall so we're always behind the eight ball but you'll find every agency now saying about the same because we've had to increase costs for payroll we've had to increase the cost of medications if it's something that is sold for ems my guess is a band-aid that you could buy in the dollar store for a dollar and a quarter, the box, if you had to buy it from an EMS uh, vendor, it's probably $5. So it's, it's that type of thing. There's a significant amount of, uh, there's a significant level of uh, licensure requirement, which says, if this is expired, your sterile water is expired you have to replace your sterile water. Uh, your, your bandage is expired. You have to replace your bandage, not just your medications, but you have many of those things that you have to replace. So we throw out maybe $30,000 worth of supplies a year and others who are bigger throw out even more. It seems like such a waste, but I know it's not. <laughs> It's, well, it's the system. But, you know, there are places where, not in this country, we, we are working with someone who has a shipping container company. And rather than put the uh, nasal cannula that's expired into the trash, which is still perfectly fine to put on someone, they're taking those things and they are shipping them for us to third world countries. Okay. Okay. I, but we're doing that. I can't vouch for anyone else doing it, but that's our organization is, is that this is this is ridiculous. We have to find a place where these things can go. I've sent wheelchairs, I've sent backboards, I've sent you know, basic supplies, but I've sent those things that other people are just getting rid of that are still usable and are so welcome in some of those countries. Hmm. How many ambulances do you guys have? Well, um, we're, we're in the, the process of rebuilding because we actually had um, a young man who hit one of our ambulances head on about a year ago. And since an ambulance thoroughly equipped and everything else can run you two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand mm. dollars, it's a house, right? You could buy a house and and put all your furniture in and have have all the best of everything, but that ambulance is about that much. And uh, that's I had uh, one of my my daughter in law was driving, as a matter of fact, and she was pinned in, and they had to cut her out with the jaws of life, and the poor gentleman who was in the back, who was a retired cop from New York, got thrown and was unconscious and had to have all kinds of things. But, you know, those are the things that can happen. But you have at least two. We right? have four. Four. We have four and we have a chase unit. Oh, we're, we're putting a chase unit together. 
sorry? A chase unit, which is just a um, sort of a suburban type of thing oh. with the basic equipment, and someone just goes and gets there maybe before or to assist an ambulance. Our chance of doing that, we're, we're kind of debating. We think maybe getting a truck is a better idea because we can load the patient in and it seems much more efficient for the area that we're serving. If you're in a city in the town, it makes sense to maybe have the chase unit if you have things closer because then you could say, okay, this patient's stable, you can take them. Oh, there's another call, I'll just shoot over here. But rather than have to wait for another truck to come to transport, it makes sense for our, from our standpoint to have a truck that comes and says, we're gonna put you in the back and we're gonna take you right now. What's the longevity of a, an ambulance? How, how often do you have to replace them? Uh, it, it's probably how busy that truck is you know, maybe around 250, 280,000 miles. You know, the body may be good, you might put a new engine in. Mm. You know, that, that type of thing. Up until recently, we had a truck that was from 1992 and was owned by the, uh, the Navy. And it was a battle axe truck, mm. I can say, but as we're, we're starting to regroup our trucks, we're like, okay, well, we think we can give up our antique now. It was it was a classic truck. People would be like, oh, look at that truck. Yeah, so yeah put it on display. Hey, church, you want to see it. That's exactly what a thought was. However, it found a new home, yeah, so. Okay. Earlier you said it cost today $1,000 for training. I can, up to, yeah. Yeah, who pays that? Uh, just as of recently, there's, uh, because the state has realized, the Commonwealth has realized, oh, we have more people leaving EMS than we have coming into EMS. So unless an agency pays for you to go or runs their own training, um, you now, if you, you pay for it after July of last year, there's now a reimbursement that the that the state has that people if when they're finished with their training they can apply to be reimbursed up to six or seven hundred dollars so if i want to volunteer at your organization i have to call up call up a thousand dollars and then maybe i'll get some of it reimbursed yeah either that or we have to pay it in advance and hope you get through and hang out long enough to and hang out long enough to actually you know do something with us, you know, not just take the money, get the training and say, thank you very much for training me. I'm going to go over here. I said it earlier, but it seems like it's so difficult. Yeah. Well, it is. It is. Um, honestly, the secret, please, mm -hmm. you probably should cut this out. <laughs> I try to tell people it's really easy and it's a great, just, we'll get you right on in. Don't worry about it. You'll do fine. But um, we're, we're a training site as well as some of the others are training sites. So students come in and they get their experience that they have to have before they get done. Uh, they have to have, EMTs have to have 10 patient contacts. Uh, we are right now paying for someone to become a paramedic. So we're paying his way through school to become a paramedic and you know he will be here for at least two years Chances are he lives locally, so he'll be here longer. Uh, but that takes a year and a half solid to become a paramedic, if not a little longer. Hmm. What's the solution? Uh, my perfect solution is that we need to have it in the high schools and make it available to all students because you will find the mix of students, the, the kid who says, you know, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a nurse. I'm going to be a physical therapist. I'm going to be whatever. And that student will gain so much by taking the course and doing this before they even start that education. On the flip side, you also want to attract the, the kid who says, I don't know what I want to do. 
you know what, take this course. You might find it interesting. What's the worst will happen? You will have a life skill. You can almost always tell a, an EMS provider's kid on the playground. I fell, I got hurt. Is your leg still attached? You're okay, you know, <laughs> but that is, I, I jokingly say that, but you know, that's a life skill that that person will take with them. I just, I just did a program uh, the other night where we did hands-only CPR. I taught hands-only CPR and we did obstructed airway for just people, residents. And I had seven teenagers in there and they're like, this is pretty neat. I'm like, okay, how old are you? Because we can get you into a class. What is the youngest age? 16, 16. What about reorganizing where you guys get your money? What would be the perfect solution? I mean, surely if the government came along and just gave you the money, but do you, have you thought about how things can be improved? You guys seem to be an awful, under an awful lot of pressure. Across the, across, yeah, all of us are. Um, it's well-funded in places like the big cities. And we have so many people who've moved here from places like that who made the assumption. We used to do the membership drive. I'm sure you remember your dad with the membership drive where you, you wrote the check each year and you, you helped support the organization. And if you needed them, you know, that helped and you got maybe didn't have to pay the whole bill. It was sort of like a discount program. Uh, those those days have passed because people think it's already in their tax because they've moved here from places where it's been tax supported. Um, a, a true honest tax support, really government support, which is not saying that it's a handout. It's saying you live in this area you are supporting the service to be there for you instead of the, we would mail out, oh, I don't know, 17, 18,000 subscription forms and get back under 300. So instead of those 300 people supporting the organization, every person is contributing to having the organization available. And that's across the board. So. You know, that is, that's largely this place that it, it comes from, you know, and our largest user population, which I think is probably pretty, pretty much to, I'd say all of Monroe County, Lower Pike County area, is our Medicare population and our Medicaid population. You know, those are people who routinely need to have EMS. There are this, your travelers, your people who are accident victims or your people who are skiers or up here and vacationing, that kind of thing. But a large, large portion and where in the years gone by, there were larger payments from Medicare and Medicaid and they've reduced it and reduced it and reduced yeah. it. And the number of things covered by insurances have been reduced. Um, a, a perfect example is prior to say the Obamacare revisions, there were maybe about 287,000 reasons somebody on Medicare might go to the, the hospital in an ambulance there's about 28,000 now. So, and you cannot go after a person. I can't say, and I think my agency would say, you know, we can't go after that person who we know has no means to pay us as a senior citizen. You know, we will accept what is paid. But now in our area, we have this little bit of tax coming in. So we're saying, okay, we're going to treat you as if you were a subscriber. We're going to give you that discount. We're going to, we're going to say, if your insurance pays something and you owe it, what's balanced? We're not, we're going to take a portion off for you. 
So I can't say every agency does that when they get tax money, but that's what we're doing. It would seem to be one of the things you have got, you guys have going against you is that I don't think people normally think of ambulances unless they have to use one. Right. Until it's an emergency, right? Yeah. yeah. It, well, it's yeah. just not part of your consciousness until you have an accident or right. something. Until you need it. And I always say um, fire fire trucks come in with the lights on and yeah. all those horns and yeah. there's big lights and people see all kinds of activity happening. An ambulance comes in, we pull in your driveway, we take care of that one person, we go. And very quietly, all of a sudden, we've made a big impact for that person, but the people who were next door had no idea. We came and we took and we went. Yeah. You know, the quiet so, service. Right? It is. Sort there of. you go. That might be the new tagline. Yeah, the quiet I service. Um, I think that for us, part of that get the next generation is the outreach, doing those classes, getting people in involved. I have people who are retirees who have said, "I'm going to take the course, and I'll come and do this." three days a month, do I say, oh, sure, I welcome those people. You know, they're active people, they want to do something. They say, you know, I retired and I don't really have a whole heck of a lot of exciting things to do. This is, you know, as long as I can do the lift and I can help move and I understand and I can write the reports. You've seen a lot of changes in EMS. I sure have. Where do you... I'm asking you to predict the future. What, what, what do you see happening? Um, you're going to see things like, instead of only being able to go to a hospital, we may be able to take a person to an urgent care because that cut that you have doesn't require you tying up a hospital ER bed. You could go to an urgent care with that. Hmm. We'll see that happen. Um, we'll see a lot more, in some places, telemedicine with EMS agencies doing some telemedicine. They've done, um, they've done programs where paramedics will go to a house in between doctor's visits to check up on a patient, to weigh them, to make sure they're taking their meds correctly to see if they have any questions for the doctor and then send a report to the doctor, paramedicine, they call it. So you'll see some of that happen. Um, I think those are, those are big things, you know, and, and what we've seen now and people don't understand, and this is a change that um, was driven by insurance companies is you will often see now an ambulance just driving no lights, no sirens. We're required now to not use lights and sirens if it's not a life-threatening thing. So people are saying, well, it took so long for the ambulance to come. Well, you have a sprained ankle. I, we're just gonna go with the traffic. We're going to the hospital. It's that extended time to go to the hospital, so those turnaround times aren't quite as fast. Now, their reports say we only save like three minutes or something like that. They've never sat on 209 on Sunday afternoon. But, uh, <laughs> but the, the bottom line is, you know, that's across the state. So, you know, that's a change right there, is that there's been that that downgrade. There's been the use of the the uh, the chase units more than before. Particularly, that's the one where the paramedic might just go by themselves until the ambulance gets there. The ambulance gets there, they realize they have to call a paramedic. They you know meet up with them, and and particularly in more urban areas, it becomes a really valuable tool. It's not as helpful out in the rural areas. You know, you get there, it's best if you can just take the patient, do what you need to do. Do you see any relief from these financial pressures in the future? Do you see any path towards? 
Well, we hope that with the, the tax supports that eventually they will, uh, they will grow to help meet the needs because the demands are growing. You know, where when I first came, maybe we had, oh, 15 calls a month. Now we'll have almost 300 or more. And other agencies here with more dense populations, of course, have sometimes triple that. You know, a dense population is going to produce more calls. This is beyond, I'm sure. <laughs> Do you think there's support in Harrisburg for this kind of thing? Um, oddly enough, I complained to Senator Brown a lot. <laughs> about the fact that when we get tax money, we can only use half of the money that we're given toward payroll. And, my, and the rest had to be toward other things. Well, I might be able to cover some of those other things, but my most important product is the fact that I have to pay the people to go pick up the people. And that's the cost, most costly part of virtually any business, and, and we're no different. The payroll portion is the most expensive portion. So she's introducing uh, legislation that is calling it the tax flexibility uh, things. 20 years ago, they passed the, the rule that you could only use 50%. And I said, today look at it today so it would allow a, a municipality or a borough to say you could use this tax money either wherever you need it or you could use 80 percent towards your payroll you could use some other percentage that's they are aware in Harrisburg and there has been a revision of the Medicaid reimbursements and one of the things that has happened is we could only charge mileage if we took a patient beyond 20 miles. And then you could start at the 20th mile with some mileage charge to help pay fuel and the truck upkeep. So they've now said, when you put the patient in the back of the truck and you start moving them to the hospital, you can start your mileage, which seems like that's such a basic thing, right? Um, we're only considered, we're not considered part of the medical treatment of a patient, oddly enough. We're only considered transportation. So therefore, if we don't put a patient in the back of the truck, basically, and take them to the hospital, that'll be one of the things that hopefully changes, is that we'll be able to charge when we've gone to your house and you had a problem with your diet, you know, you're diabetic and you just needed to get your, your sugar increased, et cetera, or you need to be checked out, that insurance payments will happen for making house calls. But right now, unless we put you in the back of a truck and drive you somewhere, huh. there's nothing. It's an interesting, yeah. If I hadn't been around so long, believe me, I would not be able to tell you all these things. <laughs> but. I, I, I didn't know. I, I didn't know that you guys were under such financial pressure. I mean, every, you said all you have us. a $400,000 a year deficit every year. Right now. Well, it'll get better. We're going to get some tax money. <laughs> <laughs> we got some tax money. Now, Fingers what close. what can happen is uh, a township right now can raise, can put on up to a half a mil for EMS without going to voters. For fire, they can go up to three mils without going to the voter. Uh, there has been a discussion in Harrisburg that perhaps we should increase it to a mil and a half. That could happen for EMS. So that may be something down the road. Hmm. you know. But you think about, I was a township supervisor, so I understand when it comes to should we put a tax on? Will people understand what that tax is? But if you want to know to hit stabilize your system, you really have to support it. Mm -hmm. We 
I would someone say, we're no longer able to support ourselves with chicken dinners, which was a staple when I first yeah, started. Sure. Was, you know, what are we going to sell? And we'll, we'll make enough money or stand in the road and collect enough money. But, you know, when your fuel costs are what they are today, when your insurance is what it is today, that kind of thing, not to mention the training. I mean, there still are all those other bills. There's the fuel, the electric, the, the building costs, the, the equipment costs. One piece of equipment on an ALS truck can be $60,000, just one piece. It's tough, I don't know how you guys mm -hmm. And I, I give props to every EMS agency you know, whether they're hospital supported or they're independent, we're still a grassroots agency. So, you know, we're, we kind of support ourselves type of thing. Well, I wonder if, we, if we've exhausted this topic. Do you have anything else about <laughs> the EMS that no, you should no, have no. asked, I should have asked you about it? No, I think we'll come. Yeah, I, I've learned you've a lot done from a, you. But, but I don't want to end this interview but without asking you about at least one other role that I know you perform in the community, that's at the Pocono Record. Oh, my, I like to shine a light on especially nonprofits and events they're doing or on things I think are helpful for people to know. You know, sometimes it's just a, an obscure agency that I can actually write something about. So you're... Are you a freelance writer? What What is your... I'm a volunteer writer. Volunteer writer. But yeah. I see your name and picture in the paper all the time. Well, thank you. You're always busy writing something. I try to write an article every week. And uh, because there's always something happening. Or there's always something interesting. I, I try to keep it varied so that people get a chance to learn different things. And if I don't know anything about it... I'm presuming there might be one other person who might not know something about it. And if I see, I get a, a flurry of, of flyers of a lot of volunteer things or nonprofit events happening, I try to put those in there or classes or things that are offered that will be helpful. And I try to, to also have things that might cover a little bit of an area, whether it's the Lower Pike, it's somewhere in Pike and, and this area and around here, or even travel out of the area, support local tourism or local organizations. And, How long have you been there? Um, I, think it's, I think it's over 20 years now I've been writing articles, more than 20 years. So you were there before, you were there when they still had the building over here? Uh-huh. I, I started by writing for the community news. You were always a volunteer? Uh-huh. What happened with the Pocono Record? Can you put that in a short, succinct story? I mean, they sold the building. The, the, the record's very different now than it used to be. Well, I, I'm not particularly privy to like their whole workings, but I know they, they moved their community news to a different type of format. So... They said, well, you could still write an article every week. We'll just find another place for you. And I'm happy with the place they found for me because mm -hmm. I think it has helped some organizations and put a spotlight on some people and done a little education and yeah. things of that nature. Good. I enjoy it. Good for you. Amy, do you have any questions? No, clear, you're a very giving person through your newspaper articles and through your service. And Thank you well, thank for all that you, you do for, for you. Monroe County. Yeah, you do a lot for Monroe County. Well, I, I, I try. I try. You succeed. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank before you. Before we wrap thank this you. up, are there any other aspects of your life that we should be talking about? Mm, it would take so much time. <laughs> I mean, they, we, they, they, you want me to get I'm on the library board. I worked with Friends at the Park. I'm on their board. I'm on the United Way board. Uh, I'm on the school board. You know, there are a lot of different places. So you believe in giving back to the community? 
Yeah, I say that every family has to have a philanthropic offering to the community. I'm ours. <laughs> That's what I always, I tell that to my mother all the time. My poor mom, she's 91, she's like, I don't know where I went wrong with you. I, I said, I, I'm not in jail. This is good. <laughs> You're not recording that, are you? No. <laughs> <laughs> She'd become very upset. Oh, no. <laughs> well, I think we'll wrap this up. It's been yeah. fascinating. Any other questions, though, or anything on your mind that you wanted to bring out today? No, I think uh, I've spoken in an hour. Thank you. Yeah, it's been great. Wonderful. Very informative. Thanks very much.